Liberal Viewer presents. So, welcome to the April 15th edition of Liberal Viewer Monday Media Mix-Up. Thanks for joining me and Cheech here, as well as... Oh, now Chong's running away, but thanks for joining me and my kittens. Uh, I'll be using the dozen best, most newsworthy clips from the Sunday morning news analysis shows from the big five corporate outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News, the so-called corporate media here in the United States for what should be a really informative, educational, fair use, media criticism, and political commentary show for you all today. Uh, as you can see from the title of the video, my topic is the big news over the weekend, Iran firing 300 plus drones and missiles at Israel, although apparently only about seven of them hit and there was only one injury uh, of a Bedouin girl who actually was seriously injured, but that's not nothing, but it's uh, not what you would expect from 300 plus drones and missiles fired from Iran to Israel. And uh, I'm actually uh, other, not, uh, in addition to the uh, girl who was injured, I'm also upset by this development over the weekend because, as you remember from the end, of the people who watched my live stream uh, last Monday all the way to the end, uh, I talked about how I was looking forward to covering the first criminal trial of Donald Trump, where jury selection started today, but uh, that was not covered very heavily on the Sunday morning news analysis shows. As you'll see, the big topic was the first time in history that Iran has directly fired on the state of Israel. They usually attack Israel through their proxies, and uh, that was the subject of all the news summaries, which... I'll show you the five news summaries uh, juxtaposed against each other, and you can decide which of the outlets did the best job uh, with the coverage. Then I'll have uh, newsmaker uh, clips uh, down in the video description. You can see uh, short descriptions of all 12 of the clips under media mentioned. And uh, I'm actually going to start, I mean, it's not a really humorous situation, so uh, there was no... Like on Saturday Night Live, they did not make any jokes about the Iran, Iran's attack on Israel or about the situation in the Middle East at all. Uh, so for political comedy, I'm going to show you uh, the way Fox News tries to manufacture these gotcha moments that don't really exist. Uh, this is from the big weekend show on Fox News, which is a, a really uh, biased, one-sided view of just about anything they cover. Uh, I've used clips from them before because they're just so bad. They're like the, the evening or the afternoon evening version of Fox and Friends on the weekends, or well, there is Fox and Friends weekends. But anyway, I'm going to show you how uh, on the big weekend show, they took a clip from Fox News Sunday that I'm going to show you later. And they pretended that Shannon Bream like won an argument with uh, John Kirby, the spokesperson for Biden's National Security Council, who actually did the uh, full Ginsburg and appeared on all five of the programs. I'll show you the Fox News Sunday clip because I also want to show you some Republicans responding to the question about, you know, do they want Biden to and uh, to tell Israel to respond with escalation and it's time to attack Iran directly that, you know, the whole bomb, 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 bomb Iran from, you may remember from John McCain and of course John Bolton, uh, who uh, was uh, Trump's national security advisor for a while, uh, is very famous for wanting to attack Iran and uh, I'll have a clip of him. I'll have Representative Mike Turner, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, and then Mike McCall, who I think is chair of the Armed Services Committee, if I remember correctly. And they're all uh, trying to justify a stronger response against Iran. But they also have this talking point that the reason this happened is because of Biden's weakness on Iran. And that's kind of what they're like. They're trying to say the Biden administration gave Iran money uh, 
and that's why they had that's why October 7th happened that's why this attack happened and the thing is this is a Fox News talking point I refuted well I showed you a refutation of like way back on October 9th on my Monday media mix up on October 9th and I'm going to I'll talk about that after I show you the the really bad analysis on the big weekend show where they try to make it look like Biden is responsible and he gave money to Iran uh, over, this is um, Jackie DeAngelis and Nicole Sapphire discussing this clip from Fox News Sunday that I'll talk about with you a little more after we watch it together over here. You know, Jackie, I want to come to you for a second. So, you know, you see the White House, John Kirby, it was kind of trying to blame China a little bit for what was going on right now, possibly when maybe this administration may take some blame in this. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to that um, interview earlier today with Shannon Bream on Fox News Sunday and John Kirby to take a listen to this. Is it not fair to say, though, that there have been moves by this administration that have opened up cash and other opportunities for them, which we know are fungible in ways that are not helping the Iranian people, <laughs> but are benefiting the elites and people there who chant death to America and you, death to Israel. You and I have had this fungibility argument uh, before. Um, I obviously take a different issue uh, or take an issue with that uh, characterization. The, the sanctions relief that has come about or uh, the, it's not even sanctions relief, but the uh, additional funds that have been made available to Iran due to a sanctions relief program that the Trump administration put in place can only be used for humanitarian goods. It doesn't go to the regime. And the idea that the regime was somehow f felt like they were freed up to support these proxies because of that, it just doesn't comport with the facts. But they have been supporting these proxies for many, with, many years. And it comports with their language, though, saying we will use this money in the way that we want to use it. They can't. Well, you know, Jackie, real quick, I just have to, because he said that, we just have to go to earlier this week when the Deputy Treasury Secretary testified on Capitol Hill talking about the money going to Iran, and he had this to say. In Iran, they've proven that any dollar they get that they have direct access to in the country will be used for the IRGC before it's ever used yeah. for their people. Yeah. What is your take? It's amazing to me, um, not only the sanctions and the billions of dollars that they've gotten there directly from the United States, everybody knows that money is going to be used for whatever they want to use it for, to buy drones, to dr buy missiles that we saw in this attack. But <laughs> so, yeah, that is like a bogus gotcha moment from Fox News where they use the deputy treasury secretary there saying any dollar that Iran has direct access to in the country will go to their uh, military activities, basically. But the thing is, the $6 billion that uh, the Biden administration unfroze, and I think it's refrozen at this point, but unfroze is actually in the custody of Qatar, the, or Qatar, some people say, Qatar, the uh, uh, small Arab country. And, well, I mean, I don't even have to do the refutation because... Uh, Representative Adam Smith was on Fox News Sunday and he totally refuted this fungibility of money argument that Shannon Bream tried to make by explaining that the money can can only be spent by Qatar and uh, can only uh, be used for, you know, food, medicine, stuff to help people. And there's like no way it can go to weapons because the dollar, uh, you know, the deputy treasury secretary said when Iran has direct access to money in the country, but it's in Qatar and they don't have direct access to, they can only ask for the money to be spent on food, medicine, and then they get like the food and medicine. And so it's a totally bogus talking point that doesn't, and Shannon Bream knows it because this is... Her, I actually, when I showed this back on October 9th, I said this is uh, uh, Shannon Bream getting bitch slapped by the invisible hand of Representative Adam Smith, which, you know, that's a reference to the Adam Smith economic philosopher, Wealth of Nations, and the invisible hand of the market that's really famous. But uh, you may remember that from my regular viewers that I said that back on October 9th. And uh, to refresh your memories, I'm going to show you this is like one of those great reverse cross-examinations. I often show the cross-examination of the week. In fact, the final clip I'm going to show you is George Stephanopoulos' cross-examination of the week of uh, the governor of uh, New Hampshire, Chris Sununu. 
uh, at, that is actually kind of already gone viral, but I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but this is a reverse cross-examination where the guest actually uh, shows how the questions asked by the host are bogus. And uh, like I said, this is back from the October 8th Fox News Sunday, but let's watch it again over here anyway. Okay, so I want to start with the Iran deal there again. Um, as you heard the chairman just talking about, we've been told that there would be guardrails on this money, $6 billion that would flow through the Qataris. And so here's what Iran's Ministry of Foreign Affairs said um, Friday, uh, warning us that they still have control of these people, they're still in custody, and adding this. The decision on how to utilize these unfrozen resources and financial assets lies with the Islamic Republic of Iran, Telegraphing that they plan to do what they plan to do with the money. Money is obviously fungible. A lot of this um, re-invokes for people, which you heard the chairman reference there, the $400 million in cash that was then followed up by $1.7 billion, or excuse me, $1.3 additional billion dollars in cash that went in a prisoner swap back in 2015 right. under President um, Obama. Some of the people were now trying to get out. They were kidnapped or wrongfully imprisoned since we paid that money. I mean, are you... Do you well, believe the Iranians can actually change look, their behavior? Look, there's a fundamental misunderstanding about what's going on here. The money that's going from Korea to Iran is money from oil that Iran sold to Korea. And Korea did not pay for that, South Korea, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, because the sanctions that were imposed mm -hmm. under the Trump administration. And there were about a half dozen countries in that situation, Italy, India, a few mm -hmm. others. All of those other countries under the Trump administration have already given Iran that money with no strings attached under a special payment system that was set up under the Trump administration. South Korea didn't pay that money for complicated reasons in terms of how they wanted to transfer it. So money of this kind has already been transferred. This is money to pay for oil that was given to South Korea. Uh, this isn't some sort of frozen asset situation. So this type of money has already been transferred. Second, the deal has not been finalized. Qatar will control the money. So whatever the mullah in Iran has to say about it, it will be controlled by Qatar, not by Iran. So that aspect of it makes sense. We're, we're still waiting to see what the prisoner swap looks like and to finalize the deal. Um, but there's a lot more detail here mm -hmm. that I think isn't being understood. Yeah, the but Trump, I mean, the bottom... Trump administration transferred billions mm -hmm. of dollars from these other countries back to Iran mm -hmm. with no strings attached. And I don't hear anybody talking about that. Well, in this current scenario, though, giving them $6 billion, and they will say it can be for medicine and for humanitarian needs, we know money is fungible. And there are real concerns that this amounts to an exorbitant ransom payment, critics would right. say. But, but again, it's, it's not, as I just said. Where were those real concerns during the Trump administration when money from a bunch of other countries was being transferred to Iran, no strings attached, no prisoners returned? So okay. Okay. It, it just doesn't seem like a legitimate complaint based on the facts of the cer facts of the situation. Yeah. So if there are people complaining now and they didn't complain them. Very fair question for them. Um, but let's do this. Let's talk about critics who say this actually is putting a bounty on Americans' heads. They include former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo involved with a lot of those discussions. Right. And that, that is a referenced. fundamental misunderstanding of what okay. this money is. OK. It's not a bounty because we're not paying the money. It's Iran's money that was sitting in South Korea. Withheld so under it's sanctions. it's not a bounty. OK. Well, let me play the secretary and let you respond. When I was Secretary of State, we had denied them wealth. They were down to just a little bit of money. The Biden administration has come in and upended all of that. And the Iranians will now be flush and their terror campaign more successful. I mean, this is a country that chants yeah, death to America. I understand all that, but that's completely untrue. Un under Secretary Pompeo, these other countries, I'm aware of Italy and India, there were a few others that I hadn't found, money was transferred from them. Same situation where Iran had sold stuff to these countries, sanctions kicked in, money hadn't been paid. Under Secretary Pompeo, that money was transferred from those countries to Iran, no strings attached. OK, so it, it is not a bounty and is factually incorrect what Secretary Pompeo is saying. OK, let's turn to Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that was the clip I played you back on October 9th. And you see Shannon Bream trying to make that argument that money is fungible. That mean you know, but if Iran doesn't actually get the money, they only get what the money is spent for by Qatar and uh or cutter some people say qatar i never know how to pronounce it but uh if 
Iran can ask Qatar to spend the money on food, medicine, whatever, and then Iran gets the food and medicine. I mean, in some ways, it's kind of fungible. I mean, if you assume that, that you know, now Iran doesn't have to spend money on food and medicine, they can spend it on weapons because Qatar got them the food and medicine. But that assumes that Iran was going to spend money on food and medicine instead of weapons anyway, which is not the greatest of assumptions. So uh, I think that uh, it's important to remember that refutation, especially when you see the, after I show you the, the five news summaries, the first clip I'm going to show you is uh, Shannon Bream making the fungibility argument again. Like, even though she got totally schooled by Representative uh, Adam Smith there over six months ago, she's like sticking with the talking points, doesn't matter. I mean, she, I mean it just shows how dishonest Shannon Bream is. Uh, but before I get to that clip showing how dishonest Shannon Bream is yesterday, I'm going to show you the five new summaries from longest to shortest, uh, juxtaposing them. You can decide who reported on the news of the weekend best. Uh, the first one is ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, where uh, George Stephanopoulos, uh, joined by Britt Klenet, uh from Tel Aviv, and then Martha Raddatz in the studio, covers the news of the weekend, the 300-plus drones and missiles fired on Israel by Iran as retaliation for an Israeli attack on a Iranian consulate in Syria. Over here. Good morning and welcome to This Week. As we come on the air this morning, the U.S. has condemned Iran's air attack on Israel, the first ever direct attack from Iran on Israel. Retaliation for Israel's recent attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria, which killed several top Iranian officials. It had been telegraphed for days. Israel and its allies, including the U.S., were ready. Most of the incoming fire, hundreds of drones, crews, and ballistic missiles was intercepted. And there are signs this morning from both Iran and Israel that this round of fighting is over and a wider war may have been prevented for now. But the region remains a tinderbox. Britt Klenet starts us off from Jerusalem. Good morning, Britt. Good morning, George. Yeah, overnight, Iran launched a massive airstrike on Israel, including 170 drones, 30 cruise missiles, and over 120 ballistic missiles. That's according to the IDF. Uh, in the early sky over Jerusalem, it, it was lit up by rockets and drones. We heard the roar of fighter jets overhead. Uh, people here urged to take shelter as air raid sirens blared across the country. Uh, the IDF saying Israel's Iron Dome system and Air Force intercepted some 99% percent of the projectiles deeming it a significant strategic success and Israel says some of the missiles did hit Israel causing minor damage to an air base but no casualties reported so far one girl is in critical condition it's not clear whether she was injured by falling debris the IDF saying that as well as from Iran the launches also coming from Iraq and Syria Israel's uh, allies France the UK and the US all helping to thwart this assault Iran says uh, th this is their response to an Israeli strike on their diplomatic building in Syria earlier this month that killed top commanders. But this, this is the first time Iran has directly targeted from Iranian soil. Until now, it has used its array of regional proxies to engage Israel, George. And, and, and Britt, there does seem to be signs from both Iran and Israel this morning that they're trying to contain this matter. Yeah, so this morning, the top general of the Iranian forces told an Iranian news agency that the military response was over and that they have no intention of continuing the operation against Israel. Uh, but Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, with a message on social media today, saying, uh, we intercepted, we blocked, together we will win. Uh, meanwhile, Netanyahu is convening his war cabinet later today to discuss uh, the next move that Israel will take. And really, George, the world waiting to see the impact of this unprecedented strike. George. I'm not sure. I'm not sure this is the right word, Britt. But how normal does it feel there this morning? You know, it's still tense. It was a long evening. When I spoke to people before uh, this strike, they seemed kind of unfazed because they said Israel is used to this. But certainly people are on edge now. And, and there's this fear that there could be a back and forth from Iran to Israel and that it could escalate out of control.
Okay, Britt Clinton, thanks. Let's bring in our Chief Global Affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz. Martha, thanks for joining us this morning. Let's pick up on what Iran is saying last night. Is The U.S. was involved in those defensive operations last night, and we're getting a warning from Iran against further U.S. involvement? I exactly, George. They say the operation is concluded, but Iran's mission to the U.N. said... However, should the Israeli regime make another mistake, Iran's response will be considerably more severe. It is a conflict between Iran and the rogue Israeli regime from which the U.S. must stay away. Uh, in capital letters there, you see, of course, Iran had also warned the U.S. not to be involved in the defense of Israel. President Biden basically said, we will protect Israel. And that was an extraordinary show of defensive capability last night. That was a massive attack. It is so lucky and, and skilled that they were able to shoot down those drones, those missiles, more than 300. The U.S. early last night thought there might be four or 500 missiles and drones headed for Israel. So this is not over, as you say, George. And I do think you will likely see some sort of response from Israel. Because no one was injured, because there was no infrastructure damage. I believe it will probably just aim at military facilities in Iran, but Netanyahu will be under a lot of pressure domestically to uh, retaliate for that a strike uh, aimed at Israel. It's the first time that has happened. You know, we all watched Brit Clinton last night. That was a very scary situation, watching those missiles and drones over Jerusalem, headed for a military facility, but over Jerusalem, and this is a country that has also been undergoing trauma since October 7th, of course. So I think you're going to see a population that is worried about this. No one wants escalation, but I think Israel will likely respond. Yeah, no question it's incredibly scary, but it also seems pretty carefully choreographed, at least so far, on all sides. I, I think it is carefully choreographed, but again, it, 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 it was a matter of if they had hit something, that choreography would go away. I think there would have been a much, much stronger response. Everyone is happy this morning that the escalation is not greater than it was, but there still could be that retaliatory strike. Again, choreographed, Iran certainly knew that a lot of its armament, a lot of those weapons would be intercepted by the U.S. and the U.K. and France and everybody else who was, who was involved in that and Israel. They probably planned for that and they, again, had targeted and they make clear that they targeted only military facilities. I don't think Iran wants a great escalation either because that's probably something they would lose uh, if this does turn very bad. Uh, so... I think this morning the heat is definitely off, but not over. Okay, Martha Raddatz, thanks very much. Let's bring in the president's top communications advisor on national security, John Kirby. John, thanks for joining us. And like I said, John Kirby did the full Ginsburg. He was on all five of the big five corporate outlets uh, on their Sunday shows. I'm going to show the one from Fox News Sunday, uh, not the one from ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, because I have like an eight-minute clip of the cross-examination of the week, George Stephanopoulos with Chris Sununu as to why he still supports Trump after saying Trump is responsible for all these bad things, which uh, is, like I said, I think already went viral, but definitely worth watching. Uh, so stay tuned for that. That's clip 12. Uh, you know, I was looking at the live comments and there, were, there was questions about uh, how the Iranian strike uh, with the 300 missiles and drones uh, fired at Israel was uh, actually retaliation for Israel striking Iran. Although, uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, I mean, the the striking Iran is the diplomatic, uh, uh, the diplomatic uh, convention that your embassy or your consulate it was actually the iranian the iranian consulate in syria that was struck killing some of uh their ircg leaders i think the iranian guard uh who are uh, possibly responsible for the funding and training of uh the october 7th attacks but uh to answer the questions in the chat there uh, i believe every single one of the five shows mentioned 
that the strike was retaliation. You saw ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos there. George Stephanopoulos, in like the first sentence, said that the Iranian uh, missiles and drones were retaliation, although uh, Israel didn't actually strike the nation of Iran. It was the Iranian consulate, and uh, <laughs> I think it's a, a, a little uh, a little rich, uh, a, a little disingenuous to uh, for Iran to be really upset about their embassy or consulate being the their sovereign territory, given how uh, the uh, Iranian revolution uh, started with uh, back in uh, the late seventies with the takeover of the American embassy <laughs> and the, the taking of American hostages. Wasn't that sovereign Ameri U.S. territory when Iran took over the embassy? Uh, but, I mean, it, I mean, it is uh, an escalation uh, to some extent by Israel and then another escalation by Iran, and hopefully that'll be the end of the escalations. But I guess that remains to be seen, uh, that even as to whether Israel, the, the Israeli uh, war cabinet met today and uh, reporting is that they said that they're going to respond somehow in their own time, but that it could be, you know, like a cyber attack. Israel's done a bunch of cyber attacks on the whole like Stuxnet thing. And uh, they, some, I think they like made some of their centrifuges explode and maybe killed some nuclear scientists uh, you know, the Mossad, but not like a military operation where they like, but anyway, uh, the, the, um, point I was trying to make is that every single one of the five programs did, uh, mention retaliation, even Fox News Sunday, even though I don't think it's in their news summary, but if you, uh, read here, I just put in the live chat, the transcript, Fox News Sunday doesn't always upload their transcripts, but this week they did. And if you search for the word retaliation or just do a like find in the document for R-E-T-A-L, you'll see that before they started their panel discussion, they actually said that it was retaliation for the killing of these uh, military commanders. But uh, anyway, I'm going to show the Fox News Sunday news summary next. It's a little bit shorter. It's uh, Shannon Bream, Trey Yinkst, and Lucas Tomlinson, another uh, uh, another uh, three-part or three-person news summary, the last of the three-person news summaries. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little more after we watch together over here. Hello from Fox News in Washington. Now to the latest headlines on Iran's attack on Israel. President Biden releasing a statement last night condemning the attack in the strongest possible terms and praising the extraordinary skill of U.S. service members in the region who helped Israel take down nearly all the incoming drones and missiles. G7 leaders will hold a video conference this afternoon to coordinate a united diplomatic response to Tehran. But will that be enough? In a moment. White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby is with us live. But first, we've got team coverage from Lucas Tomlinson at the White House and Trey Yingst in Israel. Trey, we begin with you. Shannon, good morning. Overnight, hundreds of ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones were launched by Iran toward Israel. Most of these projectiles were actually intercepted by fighter jets and Israel's missile defense systems outside of Israeli territory. Some of them slipping past, though, and slamming into the ground across this country. We could see here on the skyline of Tel Aviv as Israel's advanced aero system worked to intercept some of this missile and drone fire launched by Iran. We do understand after the attack took place that included air raid sirens in Jerusalem, Israel's largest city, and explosions overhead, that there was a phone call between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Also, Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant speaking with his counterpart, Secretary Lloyd Austin. This afternoon, the Israeli War Cabinet is meeting here in Tel Aviv at the Kiria, Israel's version of the Pentagon, trying to determine if and how Israel... Today, Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant saying this. 
The campaign is not over yet. We must remain alert and attentive to the instruction published by the IDF and Home Front Command. We must be prepared for every scenario. Having said this, we have thwarted the most significant wave of the attack, and we did so successfully. Israel must walk a delicate line here. They don't want Iran to feel emboldened to launch attacks from their own territory toward Israel, but they also don't want to drag the region into a broader war. Shannon? Trey Yanks, working around the clock for us. Thank you so much. We head over to the White House now, where we find Lucas Tomlinson. Good morning, Lucas. Shannon, for years as a senator, Joe Biden was skeptical of missile defense. Last night, it saved Israel. Our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. One week after criticizing Israel over its war in Gaza, President Biden pledged the full support of the U.S. military to defend the Jewish state in the run-up to last night's attack. Biden rushed back to the White House yesterday afternoon from his house in Rehoboth Beach one day after saying he expected an attack from Iran soon. Biden huddled with his national security team here at the White House in the Situation Room. In a statement, Biden praised the actions of U.S. forces. Quote, we helped Israel take down nearly all of the incoming drones and missiles. U.S. officials say 70 of the more than 300 drones and missiles launched from Iran were shot down by American warships and fighter jets. What is your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. A word repeated by Biden and his cabinet for months. To any country, any organization, anyone thinking of taking advantage of this situation, I have one word. Don't. 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 Former President Donald Trump weighed in last night. The weakness that we've shown is unbelievable, and it would not have happened if we were in office. You know that. Later this morning, President Biden will host a call with G7 leaders to discuss the diplomatic response to Iran's attack on Israel. The Republican House Majority Leader Steve Scalise says he wants to rush a new bill to get more aid to Israel and perhaps include some aid to Ukraine and Taiwan as well. Shannon. All right, Lucas Tomlinson, live at the White House. Thank you, Lucas. Joining us now, White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby. Welcome back. Always good to have you with us. So, yeah, uh, that new summary, uh, I think, was a little bit more uh, militaristic, a little more uh, pro-Israel, maybe, uh, although all five of these are, you know, uh, I saw a, an early comment in the live comments, uh, I think, from Zed Alpha about how this is uh, wiped out the coverage of, well, he said Israeli genocide in Gaza, but of the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, the pending famine in Gaza, uh, those I would, uh, that's how I would term it, but, uh, and that's true, and uh, I mean, maybe that will actually stop the escalation because uh, Israel is actually, at least in terms of U.S. public opinion and uh, the way the U.S. media is looking at Israel, uh, this attack, uh, all these missiles, even though uh, only a few of them got, or seven of them apparently got through, and there was only one girl who was uh, severely injured, unfortunately, uh, but uh, not a lot of uh, casualties for 300 plus drones and missiles um, that uh, maybe that maybe, I mean, if Bibi were smart, if Prime Minister of Israel Bibi Netanyahu were smart, uh, he wouldn't escalate and he would use this, uh, like, uh, increase of Israeli media clout based on now being the victim of an Iranian attack uh, to, uh, instead of escalating it and losing all that, maybe they're already opening up more uh, routes for food trucks into Gaza, maybe pivoting and trying to regain uh, the support of more of the American public that uh, Israel has lost uh, over the last six plus months that they've been waging this uh, campaign in Gaza. Uh, I don't think that's likely because I, I mean, I don't think the Israeli prime minister's uh, primary concern is 
how he how Israel is being viewed in the United States. He has his own political concerns in his own country, and uh, he has a right wing coalition that is pressuring him. And I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, the whole thing shows. I mean, what Iran did wasn't really all that rational, uh, and. I'm afraid the Israeli response isn't going to be all that rational. It just shows that countries aren't always rational actors and you can't uh, run your geopolitics assuming that countries are going to be rational actors. But uh, the other point I wanted to make about that is uh, it was not only more militaristic, the Fox News Sunday news summary and pro-Israel, the most pro-Israel of the five, but it was also the most anti-Biden, trying to like pin as much as possible on Biden. Do you see that one Chiron? I took a screenshot here. Uh, Iran attacks Israel despite Biden saying don't. What was that whole like don't montage? Like uh, that was kind of amusing from a Fox News bias perspective. And of course, I believe they were the only news summary to show Trump's response that, you know, never would have happened if I were president or whatever it was Trump said. Uh, it's one of those counterfactuals that those are the best kind of arguments for Trump because his arguments are very rarely fact-based and uh, so, and counterfactual arguments don't require any facts. So uh, great for Trump in that way. Anyway, I want to finish up the news summaries. I still have three more. The next one is CNN State of the Union which was actually on uh, for two hours instead of one hour. And then uh, they, Jake Tapper claimed that they repeated it, the two hour program uh, later in the day, but uh, they did do an, an, an extra news summary, but then they replayed all the, most of the interviews over again. I don't think they replayed the John Bolton that I took the clip from, but anyway, uh, this is the earliest of the CNN State of the Union news summaries. It was like an hour early uh, at like uh, 8 a.m. Eastern time, 5 a.m. my time, uh, where Jake Tapper and then Clarissa Ward as their reporter, uh, I believe in Tel Aviv, uh, gave this news summary. Hello, I'm Jake Tapper in Washington with a special live expanded edition of State of the Union, where the state of our union is bracing for what's next. New this morning out of the Middle East, Israel's war cabinet is meeting this hour to decide how to respond to Iran's unprecedented overnight assault. That's according to an Israeli official. Israel says that Israel and other nations intercepted 99% of the more than 300 missiles and drones fired by <coughs> Iran directly from Iranian soil during its five-hour strike on Israel overnight. The U.S. intercepted more than 70 of those attack drones and at least three ballistic missiles, according to officials. President Biden is set to convene a meeting of the G7 today to coordinate what he calls a united diplomatic response to Iran's brazen attack. It was a night of booms and flashes of light and explosions over Israel as air raid sirens wailed. Israel says a seven-year-old girl was injured by shrapnel. And the rockets did not come just from Iran. More than 55 were fired from Lebanon into Israel, according to the Israeli military. Biden met with his national security team in the Situation Room late into the night, getting minute-by-minute -minute updates as the attack unfolded. Biden also speaking with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, telling Netanyahu that Israel should consider this a win, since nothing of value in terms of targets was hit, according to a senior administration official. And the United States would not participate in any offensive operations against Iran. Iran says the attack was in retaliation for the April 1st strike on an Iranian consular building in Syria that killed senior Iranian military officers. Now the Middle East and the world is on edge for what comes next. Let's bring in CNN Chief International Correspondent Clarissa Ward in Tel Aviv. Clarissa, what, what's the latest on the ground in Israel? So as you mentioned, Jake, we are now waiting for that war cabinet session to get underway. We anticipate it will start in the next half hour. President Biden has urged Israel not to escalate further, but one Israeli official telling CNN that they will respond. It's simply a matter of the scale and scope of what that response will be. This after, as you mentioned, 300 cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, drones fired towards Israel last night, 99 
percent of them intercepted. But tellingly, the IDF has said that a number, they won't give the specific number, of ballistic missiles did make impact at the Nevatim uh, Air Force Base in southern Israel. That is where those F-35 fighter jets are, are, are based. Iran has said that that is the base they believe was used to launch the April 1st attack against uh, the consulate building in Damascus. So the question now becomes, what does Israel do next? On the streets, the feeling is relative calm, a high degree of anticipation. Uh, Israel has reopened its airspace, Jake, that we're seeing that a number of flights uh, are being canceled, a number of airlines choosing not to fly in and out, some even canceling flights across the region. And Iran has said that it will cancel all flights, civilian aircraft, in and out of the country at least <coughs> until Monday. So a heightened state of alert here, Jake. All right, Clarissa Ward in Tel Aviv, we'll come back to you. Thank you so much. Joining us now in studio, White House National Security Corps uh, Communications Advisor, uh, retired Admiral John Kirby. And so, yeah, that was the CNN State of the Union news summary, which also mentioned the attack from Iran being retaliation. Also talked about the seven-year-old Bedouin girl with uh, critical injuries. Uh, but then kind of callously went on to say that uh, Biden said to take the win because nothing of real value was destroyed. Well, I think a seven-year-old girl has value, but anyway, uh, I don't think that's what they meant. I think they were talking about uh, military targets like the air base in the Negev that w actually did get hit, um, didn't have much damage or whatever, but... Uh, I want to finish up the news summaries. Like I said, the CBS News Face the Nation news summary is just about the same length. Uh, has Margaret Brennan and then Deborah Pata. Uh, you can juxtapose it with the previous three and let me know what you think after we watch together over here. Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. As we come on the air, we are learning that the damage from those strikes overnight has been extremely limited. And we are now waiting word or actions from the Israelis about their response. President Biden spoke last night to Prime Minister Netanyahu, and we'll hear more about that in a moment. Here in the U.S., there is increasing political pressure on President Biden on a number of fronts when it comes to doing something to end Israel's six-month-long war on Hamas in Gaza. Our new CBS News poll, taken before the Iran strikes, show that only a third of Americans approve of President Biden's handling of the conflict. That's down five points since February. In fact, within his own party, more Democrats now sympathize, quote, a lot with the Palestinian people. That's a larger number than sympathize a lot with the Israelis. Our Deborah Pada reports from Tel Aviv on the attack and the aftermath. From the north to the south, Israel's powerful air defense systems intercepted more than 300 Iranian drones and missiles with the help of the United States, Jordan, and the UK. It is the scenario everyone has feared since the October 7 Hamas attack, a state-to-state -state confrontation that could spiral into a regional war. Hardline Iranian supporters celebrated the strikes as the regime boasted that their operation, True Promise, had exceeded their expectations. Despite Israel saying it intercepted 99% of the incoming projectiles. A number of Iranian missiles fell inside Israeli territory, cause, causing minor damage to a military base with no casualties. Israel is still weighing up its response, but a former senior Israeli diplomat to the U.S., Alon Pincus, told us President Biden warned Prime Minister Netanyahu last night not to retaliate. My understanding was that Biden uh, told Mr. Netanyahu, if you act against Iran based on this, um, we will not stand by you. Pinker said Netanyahu benefits from a war with Iran, given growing anger here over his government's failure to protect Israelis from the October 7 attack. Mr. Netanyahu uh, wanted an escalation with Iran as early as November.
For him, it was a way to change the narrative, to distance himself from October 7th by wrapping it in a bigger story, in a bigger uh, narrative. Just hours before the attack, tens of thousands of Israeli demonstrators took to the streets of Tel Aviv, protesting against Netanyahu's mishandling of the war in Gaza and rising tensions with Iran. Pincus also told us Iran had deliberately telegraphed details of the strike and knew most of the missiles and drones could be shot down, allowing Iran a shock and awe spectacle with minimal damage that Israel can choose to walk away from. That's our Deborah Pata in Israel. And we turn now to coordinator for strategic communications at the White House, National Security Council, John Kirby. And like I said, John Kirby was on all five of the shows. I think most of these news summaries end with uh, John Kirby. And uh, uh, that was uh, another good news summary. Deborah Pata also in Tel Aviv reporting with Margaret Brennan. Uh, you notice the first two news summaries, they used three people. Uh, the second two news summaries, they had the host and a reporter. For some reason on NBC News's Meet the Press, just Kristen Welker reported the news herself for the shortest of the news summaries a little under two minutes to finish up the news summaries and i'll talk about that a little more after we watch it together over here Good sunday morning the world is waking up to a new inflection point in the war in the middle east overnight iran mounted a wide-scale aerial attack on israel launching more than 300 drones and missiles in retaliation for israel's airstrike on iran's consulate in syria two weeks ago that killed seven members of iran's revolutionary guard including two top commanders this is the first time iran has directly attacked israel from its own territory the israeli military with this forceful response iran has launched a direct attack from iranian soil towards the state of Israel. This is a severe and dangerous escalation. Now, according to Israeli Defense Forces, 99% of the missiles and drones were intercepted by Israeli and U.S. forces. A few fell inside Israeli territory. The strikes caused minor damage to one Israeli military base in southern Israel and severely injured a young child. Urgent efforts at diplomacy are expected to intensify. President Biden says he will convene a meeting of the group of seven leaders today. On Saturday, he spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and reaffirmed America's ironclad commitment to the security of Israel. A senior administration official tells NBC News he also urged Netanyahu not to retaliate, but quote, take the win. You've hit the win. For its part, Israel's defense minister says its confrontation with Iran is not over yet, and already Republican rhetoric is ratcheting up. Israel's response, and there should be a response, should not be proportionate. Uh, it should be far stronger because uh, when deterrence fails to reestablish it, you have to teach the adversary that any gain they may hope to get by any future attack will be more than outweighed the, by the damage that will be caused. Joining me now is National Security Council spokesman John Kirby. And the final uh, John Kirby appearance there on Meet the Press, uh, like I said, completing the full Ginsburg and... Um, I'm not sure why uh, NBC News Meet the Press didn't have, like Richard Engel was reporting most of the weekend, uh, but they didn't have a report from Richard Engel in the beginning of the program there. I, I'm not sure why, but uh, all the other of the big five corporate outlets decided to have at least the anchor and the reporter. Uh, then on ABC, they actually had the two co-anchors, they had George Stephanopoulos and Martha Raddatz, as well as their reporter. But anyway, you can let me know what you think about the uh, five news summaries, wh who did it best, uh, who uh, did it straightest, who was most biased. I think I made the case that Fox News Sunday, not being an actual journalistic organization, gave you the most biased look at what happened over the weekend with the uh, Iranian drones and missiles fired at Israel. Uh, but speaking of Fox News bias, I promised to show you how uh, apparently Shannon Bream never learns the host of Fox News Sunday, even though I showed you earlier uh, how Representative Adam Smith totally schooled her on this fungibility argument 
saying that uh, the uh, $6 billion that was unfrozen in the control of Qatar uh, or Qatar or however you want to pronounce it uh, somehow was fungible and would allow Iran, it was $6 billion going towards weapons to attack Israel or whatever. Uh, and I showed you how that was totally bogus back when uh, Representative Adam Smith refuted it on Fox News Sunday on October 9th. But now, more than six months later, uh, Shannon Bream is still like making the same argument and quoting the uh, Iranian officials saying they're going to use the money however they want, uh, even though she must know, she must know she's uh, being disingenuous, that her talking point is totally bogus. But uh, anyway, here is the John Kirby clip that I guess I owe you since he was on all five of the shows. I should at least show you one John Kirby clip and I'll talk about it with you a little more after we watch together over here. You know, there are a number of critics, most of them on the GOP side of the Hill, who say we shouldn't be in this position, that there are things that were done by this administration that let Iran think it had an opening here or others that would go after Israel. Uh, Senator Mar Marsha Blackburn, among those posting on X last night, she says under President Trump, Iran was broke. President Biden gifted them billions of dollars and then naively said, don't. Don't is not a foreign policy. We also heard from Congressman Michael Waltz, like you, a veteran who's worn the uniform. He says this uh, about us refusing to be tougher on Iran at the U.N. Here's a bit of that. Last year, we renew sanctions on Iran's drone and missile program. Now they're literally flying towards uh, Israel. You know, the conversations about unfreezing assets, about waivers on sanctions. Yeah, yeah. Could this administration have been tougher on Iran? Did it sense an opening? It, it's hard to look at what President Biden has done with respect, with respect to Iran and say that he hasn't been tough on Iran, that we haven't put uh, pressure on them, that we haven't addi additional 500 sanctions, but additional resources in sanctions. the region. And let's take a look at that ballistic missile. OK, so they launched more than 100 ballistic missiles. And how many got through? And the reason it didn't get through is because President Biden made sure that we pre-positioned forces in the region to help Israel shoot them down. Uh, so this vaunted ballistic missile program of theirs didn't turn out to be so vaunted last night. But why not support something have, that would have stopped that program or at least contained it in some way so it's not launching in Israel and we aren't having to get it involved defensively? Again, Shannon, just look at the, the sanctions that we put in place against Iran. Look at the resources we put in this in the, into the region. It's hard to take a look at what President Biden has done and say that we've somehow gone soft on Iran. It was the previous administration that decided to, to get us out of the Iran deal, and now Iran is so much dramatically closer to a potential nuclear weapon capability than they were uh, before, uh, before Mr. Trump was elected. Is it not fair to say, though, that there have been moves by this administration that have opened up cash and other opportunities for them, which we know are fungible in ways that are not helping the Iranian <laughs> people but are benefiting the elites and people there who chant death to America and you, death to Israel. You and I have had this fungibility argument uh, before. Um, I obviously take a different issue, uh, or take an issue with that uh, characterization. The, the sanctions relief that has come about, or uh, the, it's not even sanctions relief, but the uh, additional funds that have been made available to Iran due to a sanctions relief program that the Trump administration put in place can only be used for humanitarian goods. It doesn't go to the regime. And the idea that the regime was somehow f felt like they were freed up to support these proxies because of that, it just doesn't comport with the facts. But they have been supporting these proxies for many, with, many years. And it comports with their language, though, saying we will use this money in the way that we want to use it. They can't. They physically can't do that. OK, let's talk about China, because uh, there's plenty of reporting. that. The <laughs> so, yeah, you see, Shannon Bream is still making the bogus arguments she made back in October, even though it was refuted to her back in October. But uh, uh, I guess this is what uh, Bill Maher on Real Time with Bill Maher calls a zombie lie. <laughs> like, you can kill the lie over and over again, but they don't care. It just keeps rising up. Uh, I think I made a video about uh, a zombie lie about uh, Obamacare before Obamacare passed back when Bill Maher was uh, worth taking clips of, I guess. I haven't taken a Bill Maher clip in a long time. He's just uh, uh, almost, uh, he gets played on Fox News all the time because, well, I don't, that's a whole tangent I don't want to go off on. But anyway, I just wanted to show you that full John Kirby clip from Fox News Sunday that you saw kind of uh, 
misrepresented in the uh, big weekend show clip I showed at the beginning. And uh, now I want to show you uh, several Republicans here. Uh, well, three Republicans uh, responding differently to the opposite argument that you saw that, you know, they were saying Biden's weakness has uh, caused Iran to uh, be military, you know, to be emboldened. And then the other argument is, and we have to respond with overwhelming force or proportionate or like somehow Israel has to retaliate for Iran retaliating for Israel striking their consulate in Syria, which that's how you get escalation. Like every time something happens, you have to retaliate. And John Bolton makes like the worst case scenario. This is like how World War I started. Uh, I mean, he's like really wants to escalate. Like you can't, you can't have a proportionate response. You have to have a disproportionate response. That's, I can't believe John Bolton like has any credibility left at this point but uh i'm gonna he showed up on cnn state of the union and uh made his argument over what here. is your assessment of what is of what's happening right now you said uh, earlier on cnn that this is a huge failure of both u.s and israeli deterrence right uh, last night the iranians launched 320 plus uh crews and ballistic missiles and drones uh it's it's a, a blessing that the Israelis find only 1% got through. Uh, but not every night is going to be that good. And unless Iran sees a powerful response, that risk will continue. Uh, and the way to reestablish deterrence is not proportional. That's academic talk. The way you establish deterrence is by telling your adversary, if you ever try that again, the price you will pay will be so much higher than any gain you think you can get, you shouldn't even think about it. So I think Israel has a wide range of potential targets. You start by flattening Iran's air defense capabilities. Uh, next, you might go after headquarters of the regular military and the Revolutionary Guards. You could consider going after their oil infrastructure, uh, the oil fields, the distribution pipelines, the export port facilities. Uh, and, and most importantly, I think Israel should be looking at this as an opportunity to destroy Iran's nuclear weapons program, which is the existential threat that Israel faces. I don't know what they'll do. I can't predict it. But I will tell you this. If Joe Biden, as some press reports have it, is urging the Israelis not to retaliate at all, he is an embarrassment to the United States. This is an American interest to make sure that Iran, which is the principal threat to international peace and security in the region, uh, is at a minimum put in its place. <coughs> to spare Israel, to spare the Gulf Arabs, to spare us from the threat uh, that they pose. <laughs> so, I, I, I don't know. I think it may be like a badge of honor to have uh, John Bolton accuse you of being an embarrassment to the United States because, in my opinion, John Bolton is more of the embarrassment. Um, I mean, at least uh, he's got the mustache, but... Uh, John Bolton and his mustache both appeared on CNN State of the Union for reasons I'm not sure. Why, why did they have John Bolton on? In fact, I don't think he appeared in the replay uh, that happened like an hour later. They had like uh, first from uh, like 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern Time. They played the original version of CNN State of the Union and then from like 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, they replayed it with a few little live parts interspersed between the pre-recorded interviews. And I'm not sure they even replayed John Bolton in the second one, but uh, I looked for it and I couldn't find it. But uh, maybe they felt guilty about <laughs> showcasing John Bolton's extremely militaristic opinions uh, that could... I mean, if anyone's going to get us into a world war, it's people like John Bolton is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm going to show you next the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner, over on NBC News's Meet the Press with Kristen Welker, where Kristen Welker actually asks him about his Republican colleagues who 
want a stronger or a direct U.S. attack on Iran. Uh, and he's not as uh, uh, severe as John Bolton was in that last clip. He tries to avoid the question, uh, but he also tries to bring up that bogus talking point that you saw on Fox News about how Biden has given billions of dollars to Iran, and that's why this all happened. And Kristen Welker, uh, to her credit, she actually pushes back like you would never see Shannon Bream, even though Shannon Bream obviously knows it's a bogus talking point. She would never push back like Kristen Welker did uh, over in this Let me clip. ask you about what your Republican colleagues are saying, because I want to get specific about what you know, some of your Republican colleagues are saying. This calls for the United States to respond directly by striking Iran. Would you support that? Should the United States go on offense and strike Iran engage directly with Iran? I think what the United States needs to, to do is to understand that Iran has already taken the next step, excuse me, of, of understanding that they get a free pass for attacking Israel directly from Iranian soil from the United States. And, so is that and a I yes? Do believe that is they that will a yes, Congressman? Believe, no, You're I saying... Believe that they will, I believe that they will do it again. And I think the United States needs to make clear, which this administration has not, that if they continue to attack uh, Israel, that yes, they will get a response from Iran. Iran is in a very vulnerable position. It's nuclear. It, first off, it should never be allowed to be a nuclear weapon state. This administration gave it six billion dollars um, to uh, release detainees. It has Wait, continued those, oh, hold to. Hold on, those assets were frozen, Congressman. As you know, th those are Iranian funds, and the assets are now frozen. Let me ask you this, Donald this Trump. This administration permitted me... Iran to have access to six billion dollars that it did but not those, have access those, to. But before. those assets this are frozen. And haven't made their way to Iran, this, as you know, Congressman. This administration has continued to um, where to, to fail to recognize that Iran is an adversary. It's an adversary to Israel. Uh, it is coordinating Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis in Yemen, and attacks on, on commercial waterways. The administration continues to look the other way and fail to recognize that this but is escalating Congressman, and they're going to have to step up to the, the plate. The, the administration has done what you, you've said that they should do, which is to warn that there will be countermeasures if Iran continues to escalate. I'm asking you what should be done right now. Donald Trump's national former security, former national security advisor John Bolton called on Israel to destroy Iran's nuclear weapons program. Would you support that? Well, first off, Israel shouldn't, uh, and, and the United States have made it very clear that Iran should never be permitted to become a nuclear weapon state. This administration, however, have been has been very slow to to step up to that declaration. They have instead instead worked to try to engage Iran um, and mm -hmm. it failed to see it as an adversary, as really the a malicious well, force that is destabilizing the Middle East. You, While I Iran was destabilizing. Yeah. In the Middle East, they continued to work with Iran, and and I think they've emboldened Iran. Well, <clears throat> this administration's failing to say there is a red line. There should be a red line. Congressman, after Donald Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, Iran is now closer to developing a nuclear weapon. But can you just answer my question? Would you support that? Would you support Israel targeting Iran's nuclear weapons program? Just on that question, would you support Israel doing that? Well, and as I was answering to you before, it, <clears throat> Iran is very vulnerable, <clears throat> both in its nuclear weapon sites, but even in its um, weapons production sites, those weapons that are showing up on the battlefield of Ukraine in the hands of Russians, and also its its oil logistics and, and export facilities. It is in a very vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. uh, if Israel uh, sees that it has to rise to the occasion to attack Iran directly in order to protect itself, then certainly I think the United States supports Israel's uh, right to defend itself. You have a country, Iran, that is yeah. destabilizing the Middle East, continues to produce uh, weapons capabilities that they're even exporting to Europe. Um, they have uh, their proxies that are attacking Israel, uh, shipping commercial yeah. lanes. Uh, they, they are escalating while this administration continues to deny it. Congressman, bottom line me here, do you want to see U.S. military action against Iran or Israel take a countermeasure against Iran? 
I don't think at this point that the United States should be engaged in a military action directly at okay. Iran. But I do believe that if this administration fails to step up to the plate and understand that we have an escalating conflict and make it clear to Iran that there are red lines and that the United States will defend uh, Israel and will not allow Iran to become a weapon state, that we will be in a broader conflict yeah. and we will have less options. It, their, uh, their failure to box in Iran and let them understand that there will be consequences makes it make it more dangerous every day. As you know, this aid package that would provide aid. And then Kristen Welker also asks about the whether Congress is going to pass various aid bills, which is an important question. Uh, but I like the way Kristen Welker pushed back on the Republican talking points that you never see on Fox News, of course. Uh, first, well, she said the assets were frozen. She didn't go into to the whole thing about how it's in the control of Qatar and uh, can only be used for humanitarian purposes where like Qatar spends the money and gives the food and medicine that didn't come up. But uh, she did do a brief pushback on the funds being frozen. And then uh, also about the uh, nuclear deal that uh, the Trump administration got rid of that uh, kept Iran farther away from a nuclear weapon than not having the deal it, like at least gave like 10 years. But anyway, that's a whole different issue. But uh, that was pretty good cross-examination from Kristen Welker. Uh, the next clip is uh, Representative Mike McCall over on CBS News's Face the Nation uh, being asked a similar question about uh, whether there should be, not whether the U.S. should strike Iran, like you actually saw Kristen Welker bringing up what John Bolton said in uh, the previous clip, but uh, instead here, just like whether Israel or whether Iran should be directly attacked as retaliation for the retaliation or whatever. And uh, this is only a minute long, but I thought I'd show it to you over so I'm sure then you don't agree with some of your Republican colleagues who are saying that this necessitates any kind of military action against Iran? Well, I do think that this is a choice for Israel. We cannot have daylight between us. We had some daylight prior to this when we were joined with them. And I know Gantz came out with a statement saying we want to be joined with our regional partners. The war cabinet members yes. who is more centrist than Prime Minister Netanyahu. I think a proportionate response here. I think one option would be to take out the facilities where these drones and rockets came from and also destroy the manufacturing facilities that build the drones and rockets, not just for Israel's sake, but also for Ukraine's sake, because these rockets and these drones are being bought by Russia and they're killing Ukraines every day. What happened in Israel last night happens in Ukraine every night. And Ukraine's ambassador to the United States, Oksana Makarova, was tweeting about that point. She called it an axis of evil between Russia, Iran, and North Korea. But the Speaker of the House. So, yeah, there you see uh, Mike McCall come up with a more proportionate idea. Oh, Cheech is back. Uh, he uh, wanted some attention so and wanted to be on camera apparently so yeah uh, you can use uh, Cheech I, I'm using Cheech here as my emotional support animal having uh, reported on all that conflict and uh, I think Mike McCall was like the least willing to go the John Bolton route he had the most proportionate response like bomb Iran, but just the places where they build the drones and missiles, but that also would not be such a great outcome of this uh, news over the weekend if uh, Israel were to, I, I believe if Israel were to bomb Iran, they would probably be a lot more successful in causing damage than uh, the Iranian missiles and drones were uh, when they uh, hit Israel. Oh, and earlier in the live comments, uh, I saw someone, you know, when I mentioned that this uh, seven-year-old who, uh, Bedouin girl who was seriously injured, that I said she had value, asking if Palestinian children had value. I saw that question in the live comments. Um, well, first of all, the, the girl, you know, the Bedouin, she was a Bedouin Arab, not like an Israeli Jew or whatever. But uh, if you go back and watch my live stream, Last week, uh, I talked multiple times about the 14,000 children who had been killed so far in the Israeli war on Gaza. 
and uh, you go like 50 minutes into my live stream last week, I was looking through the transcript. And I talked about how you know that about it being heartbreaking. Uh, so yeah, I I do also believe that Arab and uh, well the Israeli casualty from the strikes from Iran was uh, a Bedouin Arab girl, but also Palestinians. Uh, 14,000 Palestinian children also have value, which I actually said in my live stream last week when the number 14,000 was reported and uh, what <laughs> I talked about the stupid Fox News talking point that, you know, Biden killed 10 people in his in retaliation for the killing of 13 soldiers in his uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan and seven of those were children. Like, that makes up for 14,000 Palestinian children. No. And how is that a counterpoint? That is an argument I made last week in my live stream. So I just wanted to finish up with that. Uh, but before I finish up with my newsmaker comments, or my newsmaker clips, sorry, uh, I do want to briefly stray into uh, the topic I was hoping to cover uh, this Monday, the beginning of Trump's criminal trial and uh, the maybe, uh, finally Trump getting some consequences beyond, you know, more than the hundreds of millions of dollars he uh, already owes, uh, from his, uh, civil liability for wrongdoing, uh, regarding E. Jean Carroll and his, uh, civil fraud case in New York. Well, his New York, uh, criminal trial started this week and, uh, George Stephanopoulos had on Chris Sununu, who was a big supporter of Nikki Haley, but now has endorsed Donald Trump. He's, you know, supposedly this rational, uh, centrist Republican governor from New Hampshire, uh, son of uh, John Sununu, uh, kind of famous from the Bush administration. But uh, he all of a sudden, even though he said all these terrible things, you know, about Trump's election denialism and uh the crimes he's committed or has been accused of committing but not yet convicted uh but of course when you're deciding who you should vote for or endorse it's not like beyond the the uh burden of proof isn't beyond a reasonable doubt there's a lot of evidence already and uh but chris sununu like sticks to his lack of principles, I guess you would say, in his uh, responses to George Stephanopoulos, which uh, this is the cross-examination of the week. I think uh, George Stephanopoulos did a great job uh, pointing out Chris Sununu's lack of uh, principles here, which is probably why uh, this clip kind of already went viral. I cut out the very beginning because uh, it's already like eight minutes long, which is uh, too long. I think it's even over eight minutes. But uh, the very beginning, George Stephanopoulos asks about the, you know, are, will you still support Trump if he's convicted in the uh, New York criminal case that is starting tomorrow or now that's today? But uh, I cut out that part. But uh, in the live uh, comments, I just put a link to the full this week with George Stephanopoulos transcript, you can see the whole thing. Uh, but this is where uh, George Stephanopoulos uh, does the best part of the cross-examination that I, I was criticizing people, cross-examining Chris Sununu uh, and many times where uh, they do this uh, talking point where you say, you know, why are you supporting Trump when he's done all these evil things? And he's saying, well, 50% of the American people support Trump when he did these evil things. Yeah, but why are you, is the question. Why are you? And I'm not talking about politically. I'm talking about right and wrong is the part where I decided to start showing it. And uh, I'll talk about this 8-minute, 22-second clip after we watch it together over here. So I'm asking you about right and wrong. You think it's you're, you're comfortable with the idea of supporting someone who's convicted of a, oh, no. of a federal crime as president? No, no. I don't, I don't think any American is comfortable with any of this. I, they don't like any of this, of course. But, I mean, when it comes to actually you know, looking at, the, at each of these trials, um, as they kind of take place, whether it's this year or next year, or as they kind of line up, the, the, right now this is about an election. 
right? This is about politics. That's what people are judging this on. And the, the ultimate you know, decision will be, will be in November to see where people are. But for, for months and even over a year, we've heard that these are the things that are going to bring Donald Trump down. It's not. And to think that the American public is going to be massively swayed by this, uh, politically or otherwise, um, that's, that's not going to happen. But I'm asking if, if whether anything, you're going to be Trump swayed has, by has, yeah. I'm at, you're a governor. No. You're an elected no. official. I'm asking whether you're going to be swayed by it. Yeah, look, nobody should be shocked that the Republican governor is supporting the Republican president. Do you know what the real story is? The average American that has gone from Biden back to Trump, the average American that is feeling inflation and all these other issues that says, look, through all this, all this, whether there's a conviction or not, we want a culture change in Washington, D.C., and we'll continue to support the former, pres former President Trump. That's the real story, right? That Trump is leading in the polls across America in, in a lot of these different polls. So no one should be surprised by, by my support. What the, I think the real discussion is, you know, America's moving away from Biden. That's how bad Biden has become as president. There's just no doubt about it, right? You can't ignore you inflation. You can't ignore the border and say that, that these issues in the courthouse are going to be the one thing that brings Biden back in, into office. It's not going to happen that way. As you mentioned, this is only one of several indictments the pre former president is facing, uh, perhaps the most consequential one, of course, related to January 6th. Right after that January 6th attack, I'm going to put this up on the screen. You said... It is clear that President Trump's rhetoric and actions contributed to the insurrection. The domestic terrorists who attacked the United States Capitol must be held accountable and prosecuted. Do you stand by that statement? 100%. Of course, they, they have to be prosecuted, and they are being prosecuted. That's good. I think he actually, there was, his, his actions absolutely uh, contributed to that. There's no question about that. I hate the election denialism of 2020. Nobody wants to be talking about that in 2024. I think all of that was, was absolutely terrible. But what people are going to be voting for, what I, why, the reason I'm supporting not just the president, but a Republican administration, that's what this is. They want a culture change in Washington. All the rules and policies that pound down on the American people, all the... If, the the, the wokeness, right? The fact that folks in Washington, liberal elites in Washington, want to stand on the shoulders of hardworking American families that built this country, defended this country, and tell them how to live their lives. They're angry. They're upset. That's the culture change that people want to see. People are upset by January 6th. They're upset by the election denial. They have every right to be. I am. But at the end of the day, they need a culture change to get America back on track. So, but, 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 but wait a second right there. Your, your words were very, very clear on January 11, 2021. You said that President Trump's rhetoric and actions contributed to the insurrection. No other president in American yes. history has contributed to an insurrection. So please explain, given the fact that you believe he contributed to an insurrection, how you can say we should have him back in the Oval Office. It's not because for me, it's not about him as much as it is the, uh, having a Republican administration, Republican secretaries, Republican rules, a sense where states' rights comes first, individual rights comes first, parents' rights comes first. We're going to have a pro-business economy. We're not going to have a cancel culture that has really infiltrated all across America. It's not about Trump with me. It's about bringing those more. But he will be your president. Die, right? I'm the governor You're of the saying... Free or Die State, bringing that mentality back. That doesn't make any sense to me, Governor. I'm sorry. You're saying it's not about Trump. You're saying he would be the president. And you've said he's an insur someone who's contributed yep. to an insurrection. I understand it doesn't make sense to you, George, but look at the polls. What you're telling me is you don't understand why 51% of this country is supporting Donald Trump. They're not crazy. They're not mega uh, conservatives. They're not extremists. They want culture change. So, Governor, I I'm not, ta not, I'm not, I'm from, not talking about the I'm bigger not... issue. Is... <laughs> I'm not talking about polls. I'm asking you a very simple question. You believe Donald Trump contributed to an insurrection. That's correct, right? I stand by the statement. You stand yeah. by the statement that he contributed look, his to words. an insurrection. He, his, look, and you, be look, you his believe words, that someone, you he, believe that a president who contributed to an insurrection should be president again? Uh, as does 51% of America, George. I mean, really, I, I understand you're part of the media. I understand you're in this New York City bubble or whatever it is. But you got to look around what's happening across this country. They're not, it's not about just supporting Trump. It's, it's getting rid of what we have today. It's about understanding inflation is crushing families. It's understanding that this border issue is not a Texas issue. It's a 50-state issue, right, that has to be brought under control. It, it's about that type of elitism that uh, the average American is just sick and tired of. And it's a culture change. That's what I'm supporting. That's what most of America right now is looking to support. And 
and want to change there. That's, so, again, I know you're, you're shocked that the Republican governor is supporting a Republican president and a Republican ticket, but it's about the ticket. It's about up and down the ballot, right? I want Republican governors and senators and congressmen and that, that type of, of culture, if you will. I keep going back to that because that's exactly what it is. That's the change America is looking for. And, uh, and I'm, they're I'm, not relitigating January 6th. It's not a top issue. If you ask the average American, is January 6th a, a top issue when you go into the ballot box? Not even in the top five. It doesn't mean it's not, it wasn't a significant point. It doesn't mean we all weren't extremely disappointed by his words and actions. It doesn't mean we, you know, that we tap into this election denialism, which I believe very, very, I, I think it's terrible what he's done on the election denial. But again, it's not a top issue. People are voting on what's happening in their homes, what's happening with inflation, what's happening on the border, right? Um, that's real, so you're, and that's you're, what you're going to vote for. So you're, you're against the election denialism in which the president, former president repeated last night. You believe he contributed to the insurrection on January 6th. You believe it doesn't matter if he's convicted in the Manhattan case. He's also facing another indictment over classified documents. Previously, you've said these charges are serious and Trump should drop out of the race if he's convicted. Do you still believe that? Well, he, look, he, <laughs> in a primary, look, we, we fought hard in the primary. We got behind Nikki. This is the chaos that Nikki Haley and I and, and others warned about was going to follow Trump. And that is just a, a complete distraction. I'd rather have, have Republicans on the campaign trail talking about real issues than, you know, having to talk about this stuff. It, it's a complete distraction. Doesn't mean he's going to lose and doesn't mean people aren't going to support the Republican ticket because uh, right now it looks like they are. But that's the distraction we we're all trying to avoid. Well, we well, talk but about I'm, asking I'm asking you a different question. I'm asking you a different question. I'm asking you a different question because you said in the past that he should drop out if he's convicted in the classified documents case do you still believe that in the no, 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 he, no. He's going to drop out as, after being the nominee? Of course not. You know, that, that, that's, that's not to be expected at all. All of these cases, by the way, the average American, it's all conflated, right? We're, we watch this stuff. We watch the details. The average American sees it more as reality TV. I'm not saying it's not, there's not real issues to bear there. Of course there are. Um, but there's clearly politics to bear in some of these cases. That is undeniable. Uh, the average American just thinks it's, it's more reality TV and, and, and prosecution of him at this point. He plays that victim card very, very well. His poll numbers only go up with this stuff. So to think that this is some sort of deal breaker, again, I'll go back to where I started, where people are going to say, yep, if he's convicted, I'm walking away. That's just not going to happen. Um, at the end of the day, they want that culture change of the Republican Party. And if we have to have Trump as, as the standard bearer, and the voters decided that's what they wanted, not what I wanted, but what the voters, what the Republican voters wanted, if he's going to be the standard bearer of that, we'll, we'll, we'll take it if we have to. That's how badly America wants a culture change. So, 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 so just to sum up, you would, you would support him for president even if he's convicted in classified documents. You support him for president even though you believe he contributed to an insurrection. You support him for president even though you believe he's lying about the last election. You'd support him for president even if he's convicted in the Manhattan case. I just want to say the answer to that is yes, correct? Yeah, me and 51% of America. Governor, thanks for your time this morning. Up next, Arizona. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, I think that was the cross-examination of the week. Uh, the only point that, uh, I think George Stephanopoulos could have brought up that, uh, he didn't really bring up, uh, it kind of bothered me that, uh, Chris Sununu there kept saying culture change, culture change. I, th I think he said the word culture 10 times, although cancel culture was at least one of those, but, uh, I mean, that is kind of a red flag for me. I don't know if, uh, here in have do any of you know what the word culture conf? <laughs> uh, here I put the word culture conf, German word, that, <laughs> uh, uh, well, just Google it and you'll understand why culture change, culture change, like sets off a red flag for me. And uh, maybe George Stephanopoulos could have followed up on that. That's not, uh, I mean, like I said, George Stephanopoulos. I said at the beginning of the show, he did a great job showing how uh, Governor Chris Sununu basically has no principles uh, and he is willing to support someone for president who he has previously said did many things that should disqualify someone from being president. Uh, but anyway, that is the uh, final newsmaker clip. I'm sorry, I couldn't uh do more on the trump trial in new york i 
do want to point out in response to what Chris Sununu was saying about how this whole thing is weak and uh, that's a talking point you keep hearing on Fox News. Like, uh, I wish I could have shown you the like the Fox News legal panel. All the like every single legal expert seemed to agree with Trump that the prosecution was bogus. Well, I actually did an analysis like April of 2023 uh, when the indictment came down. I did a special live stream. I'm putting a link here in the uh, live comments. Uh, explaining why no the prosecution isn't weak it's uh, actually a really strong set of facts to show that uh, Trump falsified his business records to in furtherance of another crime which was a campaign finance violation that uh, his uh, lawyer actually already pled guilty to and anyway that's a uh, whole other thing that I should hopefully be able to cover as this trial is going to last for uh, six, eight weeks. They're still in voir dire. And uh, as I was talking about uh, at the end of my live stream last week, uh, I was a criminal defense attorney for about five years, a public defender, and I did about I think it was about a dozen jury trials. I actually had a winning trial record, although often I wouldn't do a lot of voir dire. I remember a few of the trials I just like accepted everyone because I thought my facts were strong enough that it wasn't a big deal. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to finish up the show here, uh, but I do want to give you a bonus, a bonus uh, Cheech and Chong clip. Uh, this is... Sometimes they go under the comforter, and especially Cheech likes to, I'm sorry, Cheech you saw earlier, but Chong likes to burrow under the comforter, and sometimes they have little battles, one under and one out, and I captured that earlier, and here's the final Cheech and Chong clip, the inside-outside comforter battle over here. And I was just listening to that with the earpiece, and once again, I think you can hear Chong purring through that whole clip if you listen carefully. But anyway, uh, that's the end of the live stream. I hope you appreciate the time and effort I put into picking out the dozen clips and adding my media criticism and political commentary, juxtaposing them all to make my fair use media criticism and political commentary show for you all today. I will be back uh, next Monday, hopefully I'll, something more will happen in the Trump trial and I'll get to commit some legal analysis and use my experience as a criminal defense attorney to give you some insights or show. There's so many things on, so many people on the media get so much wrong about, you know, like one of the things I hear wrong so many times is like, well, are his lawyers going to let him testify? It would be wrong for the lawyers to let him testify. Well, actually, the, the defendant gets to make two decisions in the trial. Well, I mean, there are two decisions that are totally up to the defendant, uh, whether to plead guilty or go to trial and whether to testify. So it's totally up to Trump whether he testifies. He can listen to his lawyers. But anyway, I don't want to go off on a whole thing. I did this at the end of last week's live stream where I like, started talking about the Trump trial and hopefully I'll get to cover it next week, but I'm sure I'll get to cover it one of these weeks, maybe even in the middle of, if something really big happens, uh, maybe I'll do a special live stream like that one. I just put in, yeah, this, uh, one that I put in the chat again, that was a special live stream. The first time Trump was indicted where I explained why this was actually a really good case. And, uh, I think it's likely that Trump will be convicted sometime in the next six to eight weeks. I guess we'll see. And uh, anyway, uh, I'll be back next Monday or uh, unless I have some other reason to upload a video or do a special. And I'll be here every Monday, at least through January 2025. 
when we find out who uh, actually gets inaugurated as president. In November, we'll find out who wins the election, and hopefully it will be the same person who gets inaugurated in January. You never know. Never know. Uh, that's what I'm waiting. That's why I'm going to keep doing the live stream till we find out. And until then, or until next Monday, or until I see you next, I guess I'll be seeing all of you around the internet.